All right. So, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Tony. Um, I work for an organisation whose name I don't know anymore. Um, <laughs> I believe I'm called Data61. Um, I also call it NICTA, and uh, I think I'm told to call myself Data61. So, anyway, that's what that says there in the bottom right there. Um, if you don't know the history of that, um, I, it's, it's a government-funded research organisation um, based in Sydney. Um, I, I do functional programming all day. Um, I used to work for these guys, writing Java, um, until I discovered functional programming. So I quit my job, and I've done functional programming for the last 13 or so years. Um, I use Haskell mostly throughout the day, and uh, I like helping others to learn. Um, it's, it's, when I say I like helping others, it's a little bit selfish. It's because I want your code. I want to be able to use it. Um, it's not that I especially like you, although I might, but that's not why. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to tell you about <clears throat> a tool that I use um, that, that um, I actually think is extremely important. So from functional programming, there are, many, there are many ideas that come about from functional programming. So I'm going to tell you about one that I think is of extreme importance. So it's right up there. Um, and that's called parametricity. All right, so um, I'm going to assume that you agree that you must do functional programming to be successful. I... I <laughs> I, I'm sure that you may not agree with that right now, um, but I'm going to assume that. Um, I'm, I, like, to me, the war has been won, um, and I've moved on. Um, so, oh, that's what you warned me about, isn't it? I was just told it. All right, so, um, yeah, I'll tell you about something called parametricity, and parametricity is related to type. So I, I use typed programming languages um, uh, exclusively. All right, so you must do functional programming if you're going to be exploiting parametricity. Um, so it's kind, of, it's kind of like once you've accepted functional programming, now we can do parametricity. Uh, or now we can get the benefits of parametricity. So before I tell you about parametricity, I will, like I said, you may not yet agree with me that the war is won, so I'll just remind ourselves what functional programming actually is. Okay, so a functional programming is programming by which the, our program expressions are always referentially transparent. So uh, some of you may say, well, what does referential transparency mean? You functional programmers always come up with these fancy words, don't you? Right? That's what some of you may be thinking. So I'll tell you what this means. Um, uh, referential transparency is a decidable property of expressions. So that is to say, given any expression in any program, in any language or context or whatever it might be, I may ask, is it or is it not a referentially transparent expression? And functional programming is where that answer is always yes. <clears throat> so, functions, just regular functions, give us the ability to um, create these expressions. So, I don't know, I mean, think of some programming languages you might use. Most languages have like a plus function where you add two integers together. Um, an expression that uses plus would be referentially transparent in the plus part. So, I'll give you an example, but this is the actual definition, right? And that is, given an expression, the XPR, it is referentially transparent in any program P such that all occurrences of that expression can be replaced by the assignment to that expression without making a change in P. All right, so that is to say, imagine you had a program and it said 2 plus 3, or x equals 2 plus 3. Can I go throughout your program and replace every occurrence of x with 2 plus 3? And I can do that for any program. And that's because it's a referentially transparent expression. But if the plus function, I don't know, opened a database connection, let's say, then the answer is not I can't do this anymore because now there's two connections open or one or you know whatever it might be. So they're different programs now. <clears throat> so functional programming is where the answer to this question is always yes. It's always referentially transparent. So I've invented a new programming language right here. Um, basically it's got, a, it's, uh, it's got a buffer. There's this mutable buffer thing and we append things to it and it returns that buffer back having been appended with, with the value that was passed, right? So basically the question is, can I replace, um, I've got a laser. This expression here is assigned to R. Can I replace every occurrence of R with that expression, like that, um, without altering the program? And the answer is uh, no, um, because the, the buffer gets appended to, it gets mutated in place. So the, the function f, or wh however f observes that buffer, will uh, be different depending on whether or not uh, will be different depending on whether or not I use this previous program or this program here. 
Okay? So th this is an example of a not referentially transparent function. And then here's, again, in my, my inventive programming language, um, a string. It's, it's an immutable data type. <clears throat> and um, I've computed the length of the string twice for some reason. I've assigned that to R. Can I assign that? Uh, can I replace that expression with the value like that? And the answer is yes. doesn't matter what P or F are. It's always true. OK? And, and the other example I gave before is using the plus function. Or, and I'm sure you can think of many others in whatever programming environment you use. All right, so does that make sense? Any questions on that point? That's an important point. That's what functional programming is. Functional programming is making it so the answer is always yes. If the answer is always yes, we can't have for loops anymore, right? Because for loops inherently violate this property. Like when you know we do I++ plus plus or something like this, gone, referential transparency. So what do we do from our ivory tower, you might ask? <clears throat> so I'm not going to answer that question today. But I might do that later. Um, I can show you the code to do to answer that question, um, but I'm going to talk about parametricity. So, um, like I said, I believe we've won. There's no need to keep talking. I, I'm not in the convincing business. Um, I don't think I need to convince you that FP has won. Um, I, I believe this because uh, the reasoning by which I would have to do that, I think, is detailed and, and boring. Um, it just has. I'm assuming that. Um, and we use tools, one of those being parametricity. Um, and like I said, of, of, so there's like a, once you do functional programming, the, the number of tools that become available to you is just huge. It's, there's all the, you know, you hear about these fancy words, monads and co-monads and all this sort of stuff. These are just tools um, that become available. Um, my opinion is that parametricity is um, one of the most important. And it's not talked about a lot. Which is weird. We kind of like, you know, I'm working on open source with other people and we kind of assume it. Everyone knows that we're using it, um, but no one ever sort of talks about it. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, basically, parametricity um, is, ba well, it's, it, it, this is where it originated, um, which it's, it's actually not, this is, this is not where it originated. This is a statement that was made soon after it originated. But basically, it says, I th it says functional programmers. I believe it should just say programmers. Um, programmers often read about programs as if they were written in a total language, expecting those results to carry over to a non-total language. All right. So, does anyone here use Agda, Coq, Isabel? Yeah. <laughs> so, they, these are examples of total languages. Most other languages are non-total. So, that is to say, we can, you know, if, if we were to sit down and write Python right now, we could write, you know, f and then just return f and just spin in itself, right? Like we can write a partial function, it's called something that doesn't return a result. Just spins forever. All right, so th these are, so yep. So total is where that's not possible. That's correct, every program terminates in a total language. Yep, um, which is to say it's not Turing complete. Um, it can't be. Um, so, <clears throat> I think in industry and, and, and so on, we generally use non-total languages, those in which we can write non-terminating values. I like when my web server doesn't <clears throat> Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> yes. Co-programs, we shall call them. Um, so, basically, this says, th this, this is a, the abstract to a paper that says, when you reason about such programs, you may assume totality, even though you're using a non-total uh, programming environment. Actually, the, the paper is titled Fast and Loose Reasoning is Morally Correct. And, and so basically the paper goes in to say it's okay for you to do this and here's why. Um, but this is really where parametricity originated, which is from a, a guy called Phil Wadler. Um, so basically write down the definition of a polymorphic function and then he'll be able to tell you something about what that function does. Okay, so that's what I'm going to do now. All right. And, and this, is, this, is, this is what parametricity is. All right, so let's just talk about you know, anti-parametricity for a minute. Um, again, I've invented some programming language, but basically we've got this function here. We're working together on a project, you and I, and, and you write this. And then you go, what do you think it does? And I go, I don't know. It takes an integer and returns an integer. And you've called it add 12. That's all I know. What are all the possible things it could do? Well, it's that many things, right? Assuming that there's that many ints. Like some, you know, some programming environments have that. So there are that many. So you've done one of those things out of that big set. I don't know, but one of them. <laughs> um, you know, 
It'd be like playing the lotto if I were to sort of start speculating, right? But we do speculate, right? We do. We go, hey, you called it ADD12. Haha. I might know which element in this set you have chosen. <laughs> <laughs> but that is a much smaller number than infinity, which is why we use, you know, types, right? Like it, we know that it doesn't return a database connection. Um, it doesn't accept a string argument or, you know, there's, there's all these things we know that it doesn't do. Um, but we don't know much about what it does do. So parametricity is about narrowing that set of things, right? So he here we, we might use um, the identifier name to narrow it and go, ha ha, you called it, you know, we do these ones, right? <laughs> you probably added 12 out of that great big set of possible things. And so you write some tests. We all do these, we write some, we go, ha ah, yes, it does. But we all know that, and, and I've contrived the case, but we all know that that's possible. This will pass the tests. So, and we could write more tests. Like, you know, and this is what really happens, right? Let's just be clear on that. We write these tests, and we go, right, it's good, and we go home, we come back the next day and go, oh, broke. And so then we write more tests, and we keep going. <clears throat> Instead of just writing more tests, why don't we use tools that, uh, you know, that help us to narrow down that? Right, that, that's, that's what I'm going to get to. All right. Um, and and these, these are called monomorphic examples, by the way. That's because there are no type variables here. So does it, can anyone, everyone read the notation of my invented programming language? All right, so it, it's kind of like Java or C Sharp or something like that. But it's basically, here's a function. It takes a list of integer and it returns a list of integer. So the number of possible things it does is, um, it, well, it's, it's that to the power of that. Um, that so functions denote exponentiation. So we ask these questions, like, does it add 17 to every 11th element? I don't know. There's no way to know these things. It drops every prime number out of the given list. Just removes all the, every prime number. I don't know. Right, so here's where we get to the meaty part, right? Which is, and, and please speak up if you can't read this notation. Does that make sense? All right, so basically I'm declaring a polymorphic value, A, or generic or whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah, generics they're called, right? Yep, so generic. Uh, takes a list of A and returns a list of A. So you and I are working on a project. It's, you know, these big meaty ones that are just code all over the place and everyone's confused. But I see this function that you wrote yesterday and I know this. Or immediately I know this. Every element in that result appears in that input. I need to, I, that, that's a fact that I've derived mm. merely from that information. I need you to convince yourself that that is true. Has anyone got a counterexample for that fact? That is to say, if I, if I gave you this type and asked you to be ma as malicious as possible but negate this statement, could you achieve it? Yep? Does every element in the result appear in the input? I think it does. So every element in the result, that is, there are no elements, appears in the input. Yep? Yep? Ah, that's a good one. So null, unfortunately, yeah, exists um, in some programming languages, but we justify that away with fast and loose reasoning. Okay, so that is to say, um, we, we don't, I mean, I, I definitely don't use it. doesn't matter what programming language I'm using. Um, but null can denote non-termination, right? It, it's called a bottom value, right? So it's, it's no different to saying throw in exception. Or another answer might be just spin on itself, like return function. All right, so for the same reason I can throw away null is the same reason I can throw away non-termination. Um, you might say, well, that's cheating. And I actually would agree. We should not be using Haskell. We should be using Agda and Total Languages, but I'm getting there. All right, let's just do parametricity. So uh, it, it's, it's a good answer, though. Um, so basically, from this information alone, no matter how bad a day you had yesterday, or good a day, let's hope they're mostly good, um, this function uh, never inspects the elements, it only potentially rearranges them. There's nothing else it can do. And I know that because of that polymorphic value A. Okay? Yeah? Yes, as it is back there. Yep. Okay. Uh, hang on, I'll just put this up here. Um, this, so this function could square every integer in the list. This one here. Yeah, it could filter. 
right? So, so for, let's just figure out where we agree. This function here could square every integer in the list and return it. This function here, if you attempted that, will not compile. It will not type check. Are you saying in the absence of any other information about A? Yeah, so be, because A is polymorphic, there's nothing to know about A other than it's just a generic A. It could be any. So if you were to call square on A, like, you know, if, if you were to get the element and go dot square in, in my invented programming language, um, it would give type error. There is no such method square on the elements A. Does that make sense? You could say it's like Java object if that would help. Uh, yes, I, I, if, if that would help, but that, you know, there's a caveat, just like null is a caveat, right? There's a huge caveat that comes here, which is like no two strings, you know, that, um, or, uh, no equalses and hash codes and so, yeah. uh, which, which I do, by the way, like when I do have to write Java, I do these things. I assume all of that does not exist. But, but that's assuming <laughs> that any type can be part of the <coughs> I'm yeah, sorry. It is yeah. universal, universal yeah. yeah. No, but no, what I mean is that, you know, for every type in your yeah. language, you can do at least call functions and they do the data. Yes. Yeah. That's so, I mean. so we have not. Some constraints, but just that's right. So we've constrained. So we know some things about what it does not do, right? And that is to say, it does not produce elements because they all come from the input. Mm -hmm. But we don't know definitely what it does do. Oh. All right. So does it? I don't know. Re, you know, go first and second element and rearrange it, third and fourth, and does it, I don't know. That we, we can't, we have not had, had a disambiguated answer to that question yet. Um, so, so simply by taking the, the list integer to, to list integer, the monomorphic example, and just using a type parameter, we have narrowed the possibilities of what it does do. And we can, and these things, sorry? Only in that. Only in where? Yeah, but not, it won't compile for, it won't compile if I make it just polymorphic A. Generic. Or generic, oh, template A, right? I haven't done C++ for 20 years. If you don't call dot square, yep. Oh, if you did, yep. I agree with that, but that, 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 that's not the same type as what I've written here though. So I, I could do this, right? I could change this example and go, such that A supports a square function. I could do that. That's, but that's, a, that's quite a different type. So all I've said is it's just A, it's just any A. And it, I'm not saying whether it supports a square. Now it is true that if I said A supports square, then the number of things that it could possibly do actually goes up. Uh, I'm not sure. We're just trying to clarify the, the, the syntax in this particular language. Okay. The language currently says that doesn't, that, that is not able to do any function that is not defined by A, and A is currently defined there as for nothing. I, I think, uh, I haven't written C++ for ages, but I think all you've got to do is put the template keyword there, right? Can anyone correct me? I, I think C++ doesn't check until you try to instantiate it. Oh, does it? Okay. Uh, well, th well, yes. yes. Okay. <laughs> I don't remember that. Yeah. But yeah. <laughs> That's blocked out of my head. That's not the main point. Are you saying it must compile for every A? Does that help? Yes, it doesn't matter what A you put in there. It, it, it can be a, a, absolutely any A. Yeah. Um, so uh, actually the Haskell syntax for this, by the way, is for all A. F-O-R-A-L-L-A. -L -L -A. So that is to say for every possible A. In, Has in Haskell you can also say for all A such that A supports blah, blah, blah. But I've not said that. It's just for all A, any A. So. For any A, so for, for just for all A's that can possibly exist, given a function list of A to list of A, uh, fast and loose reasoning holding, then I can assert these things. That is every element, because I can't produce A's, they can't come from anywhere other than the argument. All right, is, is that cool? I think in C++ actually you can do a default constructor and call new or something like that. And by that same token, you can't filter that input because you can't, look, you can't apply any operation. That's correct, yep. I, I can't look at the element and go, is it even? I don't even know if it's a number. In fact, that could even be a function itself. I don't know that it's integers. I don't know what it is. It's just anything. So yeah, I could not, I, I could not filter it out. I could not say, it, you know, is it a prime number, then remove it. It's not, it won't compile. Um, all right, so, 
So what does this mean? I'll, I'll say, we've kind of already touched on that. What does it mean? Well, um, basically, when we, have the, when we read in code together and we, and we see this function, and we assume that it returns one of two things, we eliminate this possibility. We, we, we've kind of already discussed that, but that's what it means. We reason about this code as if we're in a total language, even though we're not. We, this is possible um, in most of the languages that we typically use. Um, so, to address that, the, so the non-terminating case. So, if if, I, if you if you and I were to sit together and we go, what does this thing do? You go, it returns either true or false, and, and you would be right, and you would be fast and loose reasoning, and that's because we would not say, oh, or it might not terminate. So, because we we add that on every non, you know, every, every time we're reasoning about our code in a non-total environment, that's implied. All right. Um, and for hand wavy reasons, I attribute these things to fast and loose reasoning. All right, so that is null, which we've discussed. I'm throwing exceptions. That's another possibility, right? So every element in the result appears in the input might not have a result. Just throw an exception. Um, type casing, that's when you go, you know, is the A of type int? And if it is, then add 10 to it and not on. Um, and type casting, which I think we all know, just turn one thing into another. Um, that we accept this as a sensible thing blows my mind. Um, <laughs> sure, just make that thing into a new thing. No wackers. All right. Um, side effects. And so, yeah, we, 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 well, I have accepted that function programming is one. Um, maybe you will today too. Um, and so, universal equals, like you get in Java and so on, the equals and two strings and hash codes and weight notifiers and all, those, all that business. So, they get discarded. All right. So to get to a point that was raised, uh, we know every element appears in the result. We've convinced ourselves of these facts. I, I hope we have, or you know, it might be tenuously holding on there, but that's okay. Um, how, do we narrow it, how, how do we narrow it down further? Um, and how do we work out exactly what it does? So this is some Haskell notation. Um, the gray's not working out, is it? Didn't think of that. All right, so this is a Haskell function. So basically this says in Haskell, I'll show you the black bit, it says, given a list of A to a list of A, and that's the polymorphic A, all right? So that's just for all A. And uh, how am I going to do this? I've got an idea. So function is of type A to A. <coughs> and uh, I said, uh, if I, I'll, I'll tell you what this means in just a sec. Uh, so for all X, um, and what was the other one? Ah, yes. And then for all x and y, uh, function x append y is the same as function y function x. There's friends there. All right. So basically, this is the type, and we look at and so not looking at lines one, two, uh, one and two, we know that every element in the result appears in the input. But looking at these others, and these are uh, called automated specification tests. Um, so testing as you know it, um, you know, run them through a machine and put values in there and try and make it not true and test failure and all that. But basically this says, um, given any list x, if you call function on x and then function on it again, you'll get x back. It will, x will have done, had not changed. All right? And then the other one says, if I take two values, x and y, and then I append them, so that's list append there in Haskell, that plus plus. If I append them, then I call function. That's the same as calling function on y and function on x and appending that. I'll get the same value back. So it doesn't matter what x and y you put in there, you'll always get true. Is it list reverse? Is it not list reverse? Does anyone believe it is not? Yeah? I think I might need one more test, actually. I'm trying to remember. Yeah. Um, is it not list reverse? Sorry? Copy. Yeah, just ID on this. Uh, if that is ID, fail. this one will fail. Oh, yeah, I yeah, I'm yeah. sorry, I, I didn't quite understand that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you asking about the append? What I'm saying is, if it was list reverse, the first one's right, but the second one should be correct. If you can't go function on right and then append it to function on left. Okay, so if you think if I put reverse there, so let's do this, right? Let's put reverse here. 
And now let's think of two values, x and y. Just two lists. They can be any. They, can, they have to be monomorphic, so lists of integers, let's say. Let's think of a value for x and y and falsify this test. So can you give me an x and y? And this is... One, two, three. So x is one, two, three. Yeah. Y is four, five, six. Yeah. All right, so if we call reverse on one, two, three, four, five, six, we will get six, five, four, three, two, one. And here I put four, five, six. What have I done wrong? Oh, yeah, I haven't done it wrong. It's going to say, my head just exploded. Uh, so, um, <laughs> so if I put one, two, three there and then reverse it, that's three, two, one. And then four, five, six there, it's six, five, four when reversed. And then I append those and I have six, five, four, three, two, one. All right, so that holds for reverse. Um, you have shattered my confidence a little bit, but before that, <laughs> I would have told you it's definitely reverse. Um, and the paper by Wadler will is where I would go to figure out if I'm making a mistake. <laughs> All right, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. Um, or I could write a proof, actually. Um, th there might be one test that I'm missing, which would be... Uh, that's complete. Is it complete? Properties are complete. Thank you, Phrase. I believe in you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Um, so basically, you know, what do I do in my ivory tower writing Haskell all day? I write all this math stuff. Now, sometimes I write tests. Like, here I am writing tests. Well, you can't really see them, but here I am writing tests. All right? So, but there are occasions when the tests are unnecessary. So, again, in Haskell notation, this A is polymorphic. Because, so, one of the Haskell rules is it's lowercase, it's polymorphic. Um, can anyone tell me what this function does? It takes an A and returns an A, by the way. So, I can write this in my previous programming language that I invented. I'll do that. All right, so it's A... I didn't, give, I didn't give it a name there, but it's that. Yeah, who said that? Yeah. Is it not identity? Is that not identity? So no null, no side effects, no non-termination. Is that not identity? Can anyone make this not identity? And I think you will agree that that is identity. Um, and if, if we know that program, if we're looking only at the type and we now know the program, why are we writing the program? <laughs> why don't we just write the type? Um, which goes back to, should we just use total languages? Yes. Um, <laughs> ah, yes, and <laughs> you said that at just the right time, because here we have higher kind of types. Um, <laughs> so basically, um, uh, so that was a trivial example. I'm now going to give you a slightly less trivial example. So going back to uh, the point brought up earlier, um, sorry about the uh, size there. I might rewrite that over here on my scratch pad which was um, functor f, I'll make sure I get this right, yeah, y. Okay, so that's the type that we're looking at. Um, and you'll notice that this arrow here is a little bit different to the others, okay? So basically, all this says is such that f is constrained by functor, all right? So I'll read this out in English, um, which is given a y and then an f of x, so a something of x, and then that same something f of, uh, and then return that same something of y. So an example might be integer to list of string to list of integer. All right? And things that are functors are things that have a map method, right? That is, you can run, run a function through it. So, so, does that make sense? Probably not. So is anyone not familiar with the list map method? The lip map, list map function. So that is, run a function on every element in a list. And th there's a name for things that have map, and that, that is functor. So... Um, there are many things that have map. List is not the only one. Um, so basically this says, given a y, given a value y, anything, could be int, could be whatever, given an f of x, where f is anything, as long as f supports the map function, right, that's what that says here, such that, you know, this, this basically says supports the map function, then return f of y. But I did not write list of integer or anything, it's polymorphic. Um, and because it's polymorphic, I can tell you what it does, right? So let, let's, let's actually write a monomorphic example, which would be uh, int, given an int, a list of string, right? And now I must return a list of int, right? So if we were to line that up. Oh, it's not quite lined up, but anyway. All right, so f is list, y is int, x is string. How many things does this function type do? I have no idea. It's, but it's that to the power of that to the power of that. It's just enormous. I have no clue. Um, we would probably start looking at identifier names and tests and things. But if we look at on the, the one on line one, all I know is that f supports map. I don't know anything else about f. I know nothing about y and x other than they're inequivalent because they're named differently. 
then that does only one thing. That function does only one thing, and that function uh, takes this f of x and calls map on it, and then ignores the x that's within the f and puts the y in its place and returns f of y. It does nothing else. And I can do this by parametricity. Does that make sense? Maybe not. It might be hurting a little bit, sorry. So I'll, I'll, write, the, um, I'll write the code, right? So here's y. Here is the f of x, and map in Haskell is called fmap. So basically, I'm going to fmap a function. So what am I going to do to every single thing in the f, every single x in the f that's going to go where those, that ellipsis is? And I'm going to do that on the f of x. That's the thing on which I'm going to map. All right, so what am I going to do? I'm going to take the x, and I'm just going to return the y. I'm going to turn that x into the y. All right, so that is the answer, and that's the only possible answer. There's nothing else that function can do. All right, so I've mapped across this f of x. This function turned every x into y, ignoring x. All right? Does that make sense? All right. Um, and if I were to run that function, I would know that this is true. So I, I can actually infer this. I can look at this and I go, well, that holds. All right, that is to say, go through this list of integers, one, two, and three, and turn every integer into that string high, and it did exactly that. All right, so parametricity is extremely important to me. That is to say, I demand it. So when I, I demand it of myself and of others, so when we're writing code together, if you use that, I will use your code and I'll give you code back. Deal? All right? <laughs> <clears throat> Alright, so um, I know it hurts, but I, I want to point out that this is a non-trivial thing. Right? There, there exist non-trivial examples because they exist. Because right? I get this question, right? What is it that you're doing up there in your ivory tower with all your applicatives and bi-traversables? I don't know what any of that means. And, you know, I barely know what it means either, and that's okay. <laughs> but it's polymorphic, right? That's really cool. <laughs> So this here, so remember that's the arrow? Um, that arrow there says is constrained, right? So basically this says, given a function a to fb to an r of aa to an f of rbb, such that r is constrained by bitraversable and f by something called an applicative, um, I can infer many things, all right? So the answer to the question, what is it that we are doing when we write these types? Um, are we just writing fancy words for the sake of it? No, we're not. We are inferring these things. That's what we're doing. We are going, oh, well, since I've done that, I, I know, so either is an example for, um, for R, right? So either is a data type. So it, so it will work with these monomorphic values at the call site. So just like I can call reverse with a list of integers, that doesn't mean that reverse uses integers. Does that make sense? So the call site uses integers, but the function itself does not. I can use either from the call site, or that, that's a tuppling, or something called a const. Um, but the both function doesn't do anything specific to those types. So, so for example, either has two constructors called left and right. So does this function inspect the either value for the left or right? And the answer is no, because it will not compile. Cannot possibly. But if I put either, if I substitute R for the word either, so that it's now a concrete data type, the answer is I don't know. No one knows. I can't tell from the type. I would. So the reason that we write these polymorphic values is not to be fancy, it's so that we can make these inferences. Um, and they're really useful, because we have proofs of these things. We don't, need, we don't need to sort of write tests or go and ask. I mean, we, has, has anyone worked in an organisation where there's someone who sits in an office and they're the people you go and ask if you want to go and write some code? I mean, that, that's just not on. <laughs> oh, yeah, go and ask Bob. He's the expert on the, you know, that 400,000 lines of code. He'll know, what, you know how to add that feature. Not cool. Um, types, please. <clears throat> um, and, and like you know, you, you may not know what this necessarily means, and, and that's cool. But the, the point I'm trying to make is, I can do these things. I can look at this, and I can know that. Does this function open any database connections? Negative. It does not. It does not because there's no I/O there. It can't do any I/O. However, I can use I/O from the call site. All right. So we imagine this is like some giant program. Does it does it do any does it do any prints? No. I already know that it doesn't. I don't need to look any further. There might be a call site that does, but this particular component of the program does not. Um, and as, as we've discussed earlier, A and B itself may be anything, like strings or whatever. 
Um, but it doesn't do it, you know, does it say is A even? No, it can't do that, it won't compile. Um, and then just to kind of keep mocking the, uh, the idea that we write fancy things, because I just pulled this one out of the library that I use often. Um, you know, I look at this type and go, holy crap, what does that do? Um, something, 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 which is probably what you're doing right now. However, importantly, I can derive theorems about what it doesn't do. So that's going to help me answer the question. What does it do? I don't know. I'm pretty baffled right now. But I can figure it out by looking at the polymorphic types. Um, and I can be reliable, because who makes mistakes in figuring out what functions do? I do. You know, who's opened up the Java doc and gone, oh, yeah, I know what that function does. Goes and writes code next week. Crash. Oh, it didn't do what I thought it did. Yeah. Right. right so. <clears throat> um, my goals, so I'll just tell you, my, my goals are to fix bugs in when I create them and to never care about them ever again. And I argue that you have to do functional programming and you have to use parametricity if you aspire to these goals. I am not cool with this. Right, this is uh, the F35 aircraft and I only need to read this paragraph to know what's happening in their little software development. Right? I, I think we all probably can do this. Um, you know, the block 3F was not working and um, so all I'm doing is putting a paragraph there to say this is what I, not, I don't want to do. I don't want to work on the F35 team. <laughs> all right? <laughs> um, so so I, I hope I've answered these. These are some questions that I get occasionally and they come in all kinds of varieties. What am I doing in the ivory tower writing indexable applicatives, blah, blah, blah. I am exploiting parametricity. Um, usually, mostly, because it's, it's quite important. That's really what I'm doing. Um, that's what most of us are doing. Um, if, you know, I, I can sympathise with the idea that if you've not used functional programming or Haskell or something, you sit outside and you, you look at this code that I've just shown, you go, holy crap, what was that? I'm getting, you know, I'm, it's, it's, I can write my code here, it works fine over here. What was that? But the answer to the question is, I, I, I am not writing those fancy things for any other reason other than I get a return on that investment, and that is, in this case, parametricity. I know what the function is not doing very reliably. So that's really what's happening. All right, um, thank you um, for listening, and um, I hope to use your code and share code with you in the future, um, and I hope you understand parametricity a little bit better than you did 30 minutes ago. Thank you. <clears throat>so we uh, definitely have time for lots of questions so if you have a question just raise your hand uh, shout it out and Tony will repeat the question for the benefit of the recording Chadley so uh, it seems that parametricity is very closely related to naturality in mathematics do you um, know like, the differences or um, no issues? So I don't okay. I simply do not know I've heard this said before, and um, I'm told that there's a paper about it, actually. Ah, oh, sorry. So the question was, uh, um, is there a relationship be between parametricity and naturality? Um, and my answer is, I'm told this is true, and I don't know enough to answer the question. Um, but we, we should go and work this out. Yeah? Um, some people would say that the more abstract <laughs> program is, then the harder it is to read because mm -hmm. you're no longer talking about the other, the database connection, instead you're talking about the monad or something. Yep. Um, this is, uh, is there a trade-off or a middle ground? Yep. Um, so the question is, uh, so I, I've just argued that, that parametricity gives us um, a benefit um, in code readability, and so what about cases where we're very concrete and so... Um, you know, we know the concrete thing that we're using, um, and so, you know, because we, you know, we, we know, instead of calling it F, we know that it's database connection or so-and-so, so, -and -so. so we, we know exactly what it is. So that's the question. Um, and my answer, so th this question I get a lot, um, and I have what I would call a controversial answer, because first of all, I believe it strongly, and um, some people just don't like it, which is I don't think there's a trade-off. I actually believe that it's um, always more readable when you're polymorphic. So, or to put it another way, right, so if, if we go back to, say, uh, this, this function here, because um, it's kind of a continuum, I, I think, actually. So, looking at G here, right, now, 
fortunately, this has once inhabited this type. Um, actually, I'll, I'll show it to you here where, where I've done the... So looking at G here. So um, a question we might ask is, does FMAP get called on F? All right, and the answer is either it does because it's constrained by functor, or it doesn't and someone's put something redundant in the type. All right, so does that make sense? Um, in, this is not quite the, the best example because if I remove this constraint, you actually would not be able to do anything. Yeah. All right, so that there's nothing to do here. But um, is, is that constraint, functor f, redundant? Now, if I would argue that if the answer is yes, you have strictly made this code less readable. All right, and if you agree with that, then I think you will also agree that, I don't know, let's imagine I am doing database connections today, all right? Imagine I did this, right, and then, right, and all I did is I called fmap, right, so the, the, the code's the same. The answer to the, so we got this question now, what does this function do? And the answer is not just only one possible thing, it's many possible things, but the thing that I did in fact do was just call fmap. Um, I would argue that we've specified redundant information. That is to say, we've said it's a connection when all we said is just anything with fmap. And I would argue that every time we do this, we are making the code less readable. So I don't think there's a trade-off. Okay. <clears throat> I think you're right. Yep. But there's a bit of Sorry? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. But what do you need help with? Yeah, Okay. Um, I, I, let's just do a bit of hassle. How much time have we got, Fraser? Fifteen minutes. Okay. Five, okay. Um, I'll, I'll show you actually what functor looks like in in uh, Haskell, right? So, uh, oops. B F A F B. Right. So it's it's this this bit of code here, line six and seven. All right. Now, if you if do you use languages like Java or C sharp? at all, or you do? So you know what an interface is? So an interface where you have like, you know, abstract methods, you don't fill them out, and then implementers implement them. All right, so Haskell has a similar thing, um, except it uses the class keyword instead of the interface keyword. All right, so basically here I've said, this is, this is a, it's called a type class in Haskell, and similar to an interface. So this is a type class called functor, um, and functor is defined over something that I'm gonna call f, and the, all implementations of this have to support this function here. That is given a function A to B, and then an F of A return an F of B. So the question now becomes, what values for F will work? So what can I substitute where F is so that I could write an implementation? And one of those answers is list. So if I had a list of A and a function that turns A's into B's, could I return a list of B? Yes. Um, and there are many others. Does that help you understand that a little bit? It's like an interface. Functor's like an interface. So when, when we see, uh, oh, I deleted it, but when, when, we see, uh, when we see this up here, functor f arrow, and we're not doing connections anymore, we're doing uh, f's, and, and we see this arrow, this arrow is a slightly different one, that's, just, that's saying um, as long as f is constrained or has an instance of that type class, so f has to support f map. Now, if I, d if I deleted that, then this won't compile, because it'll say you can't just call fmap when you haven't said that, you know, you haven't said that it's constrained by functor, because functors are things that support fmap, also known as map. Do you know the map function? I think, um, like, Ruby and Python and all that have it now, something. Yeah, all right. <laughs> sometimes sometimes the, the answer to this, these questions are like, you know, let's write some code, hit a stumbling block, and and repeat that for a while, yeah. Um, not a question. In a, way that, that in a way the type constraints are actually giving permission for things to happen. Yeah. If you don't have the type constraint, you know, then certain things can't happen. That's right. And that's making your yep. better So that's right. So let's further constrain F, right? So I can I'll put the scary word in there. So, <laughs> so the answer to the question, what does this do, is significantly more possible things. Um, in fact, it's infinity. Um, and 
um, going back to you know the code readability thing, I, I would argue that if this is my actual implementation, um, I, I've done something that's not a good idea, which is I've overspecified what this function does. Um, however, maybe maybe I actually did do more than that, right? Like you know, if I start doing you know calling monad functions and so on, blah blah blah, um, it is not overspecified anymore. Um, but yeah, when, when when we so basically. I want to write the type that gives me the ability to do everything that I need to do, but very importantly, not anything more than that. And it, it's kind of the not anything more that I think is pretty damn important. <clears throat> uh, negative. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, people write linters and so on. Um, yeah. No. And in fact, if you go and look in the base libraries of Haskell, there are many over-specified things in there, um, you know, which I swear at all day. And like, like you probably do at your base libraries. Like, who did this? Blah, blah. Yeah. anything along the lines of refinement types that can help you figure out what the specification should be? I have not. Oh, sorry. So the question was, have I looked at things like refinement types um, that can help me... Sorry, what was it? Uh -huh. Right, so yeah, the question was, you know, using a, a compiler to figure out exactly what it is that I need to do using refinement types, and the answer is I, I have not looked at that. Um, I mean, other than, you know, things like Hassel's type inference algorithm, which, which does it, but no. Have you? No. Okay. <laughs> Has anyone? <clears throat> um, yeah, well, I mean, if I, if I were to write this expression in Haskell and ask for its type, I will, I will get that. So that's the kind of thing I can show you that. But that's the kind of thing I do, right? So if I say, what is the type of this expression given, uh, what was it, y and fx? So uh, given y and fx, what is the type of that? And it is, it is that type like that we saw earlier. Um, x is changing to b and y, oh, sorry, y is changing to b and x is changing to a. So that expression has that type and it's constrained by a functor. But, other than that, not really. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. 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 Identify names that are things like single letters and so on. Um, is that what is that what actually happens? I, I guess. Is, um, and the answer to the question is a little bit nuanced, which is um, yes when we're doing things like this. Um, simply because there's no other way to answer, uh, you know, to say. I mean, let's give a name to this thing. Ready? I don't know. How about X? Yeah. So um, when when we're very polymorphic, um, the answer is. Like, I struggle to come up with names. I spend most time coming up with names. Um, but I, I try to make them not mean anything, precisely because I've got this. Sorry? It, all it, so all F does is FMAP. It does nothing else. I, I know that. But yeah. at some stage, further down in the code, yeah. you actually want to achieve something other than getting <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's true. However, I attempt to hold this principle all the way up to the point that you're talking about. And I do. Sure. Um, so uh, let's come up with an example, right? Which is, I don't know, I'm going to print something out. Or, uh, sorry, I'm going to read a character from the standard input. So this is going to be IO character. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I just did. So if I wanted to take x, so given x, do x times x, um, then this says given, uh, given an a, return an a such that a is constrained by num. So a is any number. Then yeah. Um, where you, so to, to continue the answer to the question though, which is something like um, where I don't use these, where, where I do use sort of more than one character, I guess, is um, when I, I don't know, I mean there's a function called filter. It's got six letters. 
Um, and uh, and I, I don't care that it's called filter. I do care that it's not called the same as all of the other things, really. Um, and you know, it takes a list of A, and we can see we're very monomorphic here, right? Which is list. You know, it's a list. It's not just any old F. It's actually list. Um, it's Boolean. Like, well, that's pretty concrete. It's true or false. Um, and actually, that arrow there is concrete too. So you can parameterize that. But this function here does something very concrete, and so it has, I think, a very concrete name. Um, it would be inappropriate to call this X. All right, so I'm, I'm just going to X the list. Um, what are you talking about? All right, so, um, but, but you know, back here, I, I struggle to come up with anything other than X. Or we might have an argument, maybe it should be Y, and I would just concede the argument immediately. <laughs> <laughs> All right, does that help? Okay, so, so to, to follow on though, but if, if I am a parametricity advocate as I claim to be, then you will find that most of my variables are x and y and so on because I can't come up with a better name. I'm not writing these things with lists. Can I help with that answer? There are, sure. There are conventions about x for elements. Uh, sorry. There are conventions like using x, y, and z for elements, um, a, b, and c for accumulators, and f, g, and h for functions. So those can help as well. Yeah. Concur. Cool. <laughs> All right. Anything else? This is fun. Anyone having fun? This is yeah. good. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Shall we wrap up? Well, thank. Oh, hang on, one more. One more. Yeah. So, um, one of the. So, in a number of functions, I'm So, one of the features of function specifications in other languages is they actually document the API. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, um, so you're saying like we would sorry, say what, what, what sorry, the quick, the, the, sorry, to add to that, uh, yeah. more importantly, what it, we were just using conventions. We were using parameter names that were conventions. It doesn't stop you embracing that convention. Yeah, but it doesn't help you as more. It helps you understand how you should use it, yeah. but it doesn't force you to use it. Though. Yeah, so I'll just say the question, um, which is, um, I think you're just saying, you know, when you write code, you write your identifier name so that you can document what it is that you're doing about the function. Yeah, well, um, yeah, and yeah. So, you know, if we're writing division, for example, you'd have like numerator and denominator, for example. And if we did it around the other way, we'd, you well, know, that's a good example. They're both numbers. That's right. So if you just say num num. Yeah, that's right. Um, and the answer to this question, if I was to skip a whole lot of argumentation, is use a total language. But, um, <laughs> yeah, um, it's true that you can have arguments that have the same two types. Um, and how do we differentiate those? And I actually start agreeing with you at this point. Yes. So if, if first of all, we're not doing parametricity particularly well, we're using you know integers or whatever it is we're doing. Um, these they're just two integers. There's no way to differentiate them. Have I flipped the arguments? I don't know. There's no documentation there. Shall I write an English sentence that says what the order that they're in? Probably not. I might write a test. You know, I'd write a test and it says they're in this order. Um, or maybe it won't matter. Well, I mean, if it's plus, who cares? Yeah. Like, I'm not going to write, I don't care. Um, I will implicitly just not That's care. Close. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I'm right. afraid uh, we're out of time now, but All I'm right. sure Tony would love to continue talking. <laughs> All right, uh, thanks, everyone. Questions?